online vigil in support of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. My name is Susie Dawson. I'm an activist, a journalist, and the president of the Internet Party of New Zealand. I will be with you for about another three hours. I am incredibly privileged to interview now William Binney, ex-technical director of the National Security Agency, whistleblower, good friend to many whistleblowers and journalists, including Julian Assange, and supporter of WikiLeaks. Hi, Bill. Welcome to the stream. Well, it's good to be back with you, Susie. Yeah, glad to join Thank in. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you back. The last time that I got to interview you, we talked a lot about findings from WikiLeaks files and also from Snowden files, and it was a very popular interview. Um, for me, it's like all well, my Christmases have come at once to get to speak to <laughs> an, an expert, an expert who has lived from the inside um, and seen this architecture of oppression, the system of oppression that has most recently been targeting Julian and WikiLeaks. I was wondering if you could just give the audience a little bit of background about <laughs> when you when you first came across Julian and WikiLeaks and, and what, what intrigues you about them? Why do you feel they're so important? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, for me, I mean, right up front, the most important aspect about Julian is he always tells you the truth. You get the truth from Julian and you don't get it from the mainstream media over here in the U.S. or around the world. I mean, they distort it. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it was Casey, Director Casey of the CIA, who said at one point, uh, we are going to be infiltrating the media. And you'll know that we've succeeded at doing that when 70% of what's believed is false. So <laughs> that's what that's what the CIA's directive is. And that's basically what they've been up to. Uh, and the move against Julian, to me, basically is a move against all media. And it's a move against the First Amendment, free press. How do, you, how do you have an, a press that's going to tell you what the government's doing when they're going to put the people who do in jail? You know, how are you going to do that? Well, that's, that's how they're trying to make Julian the poster boy for what happens to people when they tell the truth. Uh, and this is why it's exceedingly bad for not just our country, but the entire world, because this will set the precedent of what they will do to media that doesn't obey their rules. In other words, you will conform to the state mental perspective on any issue, or we'll find a way to get rid of you. <laughs> and that's, that's basically what they did in the Stasi and the Gestapo, the SS, the, the KGB, all of them, all, all oppressive societies have done this down through history. This is nothing new. It's just that, it's just that we are allegedly a democracy and allegedly free. And this is making that a mockery. Absolutely. So from your from your experience, um, what do you think the intelligence agencies are thinking about Julian and WikiLeaks? What is their opinion and what is their game plan? Well, it's uh, see, the secret uh, agencies like to do everything behind closed doors. No one is supposed to know what they're doing, even their own governments now. I mean, I, I have one at GCHQ where they, they basically uh, told the, the British Parliament that they couldn't separate their communications from anybody else's in this bulk acquisition system. And that's been commercially possible since 2002 with Naris and Barron devices, you know? And so that was a direct, that's a distortion. They're manipulating, they're, they're un uninforming the, the, the parliaments and the government and, the, and for us, for our, they did the same thing with our Congress uh, to, to get their way and they have their own secret interpretations of everything. They want everybody to not pay attention to them so they do whatever they want to do. And that's really what their issue is. They don't want anybody exposing, do not, and they, this is like the Wizard of Oz, and anybody who exposes them is like a little Toto dog going over and pulling the curtain back from the guy behind there, and, it's, and, it's, and then they're saying, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Look over here, you know? <laughs> that's the Wizard of Oz game. And that's the game they're playing, and they don't want anybody knowing what they're doing. And Julian is a direct threat to that. Absolutely. So what is their game plan? How do you think they'll be reacting to this humming and hiring by Ecuador? Uh, well, I'm sure they were behind trying to get him them to do that, to get the, to throw him out. I'm sure they were part of that, certainly. The shadow government over here and, of course, uh, the others cooperating with them, I'm sure they were all part of it, too. And the only thing that I think that would make a difference is the uh, coming on shows like this and doing uh, demonstrating against them in the streets and so on. 
and and signing up to all kinds of uh, you know international communication between people, not between organizations that will change the uh, perspective of people in charge. So, I mean, that's the only so, way to do it. Absolutely, and I'm I'm super proud of everybody that's pulled together at the last minute, mm-hmm. including yourself, to participate in events like this. I think it is incredibly important yeah. that we yeah. visibly show how far-reaching the support for Julian is and events like this weekend are certainly doing that. Um, can you tell me, what are, the, what are some of the leaks by WikiLeaks, the publications by WikiLeaks, that are the most significant in terms of exposing the mechanics of these agencies? Well, I think uh, the, up front, the initial sum of it was the, uh, uh, well, for me, it was the uh, collateral murder uh, movie that was first put out by Julian back in... Uh, uh, I forget a few a number of years ago. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And so that uh, <clears throat> that uh, kind of said, here's what's going on in in real in real terms. No one else was saying that, you know. No one else was showing the the brutality and the and the basically war crimes that were going on. And so uh, that, of course, raised that was what, of course, started <laughs> him with his. Uh, uh, when the a deep state over here and the shadow government, if you will, decided that they needed to stop him. So that was when they started basically figuring out how to go after him. Then they concocted this story from undocumented. Un, un, there were no, I mean, as far as I knew, there were no formal complaints against him, but the Swedish government still joined in because they're a part of it too. Okay. These governments all around the world have. Yeah, they, 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 dropped, they dropped the initial investigation. They actually, um, I saw a piece in The Guardian yesterday, which <clears> The Guardian <throat> had on its homepage. They said, explainer, why is Julian in the embassy? And they said, Julian was in Sweden and he had accusations made against him by a Swedish woman. And then he was in London and blah, blah, blah. And I, I noticed straight away, they <laughs> skipped. How did Julian get from Sweden? to London if these if these allegations were being made. And the answer is because the Swedish prosecutors investigated and said there was no case, then Julian requested permission to go yeah. to the UK, was granted that permission to go to the UK, and then it was after the fact that a special prosecutor was appointed in Sweden to reopen this and to turn it into an investigation. And that has been completely omitted by the mainstream media. Yeah, but uh, I'm sure the shadow government over here was behind a lot of that, pushing that, and uh, through their own channels to these other, to Sweden, the Swedish government, and all that too. So, uh, you know, I, this is just an international um, organization of trying to trying to subvert. I call this. I called it originally population control. Uh, that's fundamentally what they're after. They want to make sure that everybody does exactly what they're told. Pay no attention to what they're doing. They'll take care of us. You know. That's the, right. whole, that's so, the whole idea. So earlier I mean, on when I was talking with Helen Razor, we, we were discussing the militarization of police and these yep. modern day modern day jackboots on the ground, you know, the riot cops yep. that we see in France maiming and injuring people, assaulting people at, that we saw at Standing yep. Rock in the United <laughs> States. But the intelligence agencies seem to be the central nervous system of the police yep. state. Is that an accurate description? Uh, yes, uh, I call them the, uh, for example, uh, uh, this is why I think NSA is so key in this, because they have become the <clears throat> the repository for all this bulk collected data for every country participating. So in other words, if the BND is collecting data on German citizens and they pass it to NSA, NSA stores it there, and then the BND accesses it using the X key score query program. Uh, and so, and they're doing this for the five eyes and about nine other countries. Japan, Germany, Poland, and a few others, uh, probably Denmark, Sweden, you know, France, <laughs> Israel, and so on, the, the, the closer allies that they're working with. But uh, they become the repository even for internally in the NSA. I mean, when, uh, <clears throat> when the FISA court issued that, uh, that uh, uh, Verizon warrant, it was a general warrant to Verizon, it was the FBI requesting it. But if you look closely, it said they're requesting that they send all the data to NSA. Now, why is that? Because NSA now has all the all the storage and they have all the data and they have all the manipulating programs. And FBI and DEA all follow, all query that database using uh, uh, IC Reach, basically, is the new program they're using for that, including the Five Eyes are part of that, too. 
So they're all querying the same database. <clears throat> and that's because NSA is paying for all this large storage facilities, you know, so they can store the data. So then they have allow access to all the participating partners. So they've become the repository for all the data and therefore all the knowledge that all these, uh, all these agencies and countries have. Absolutely phenomenal. And now I've done a bit of study on the fusion centers in the United States, and I discovered that the first fusion centers were actually in war zones. They were military facilities, military intelligence sharing facilities. But now we have these fusion centers on domestic US soil and in other countries as well. And we know that those fusion centers are uh, collecting information from or, or are filtering information to and from not just police department, you know, the police station on the corner, but mm. also from uh, private industry that has been deemed critical infrastructure, for example, banks, telecommunications companies, transport okay. companies, mm. and these types of things. So I'm just wondering, like, does this mean that <coughs> from the NSA at the top of the central nervous system, <coughs> the, the intelligence agencies, down to the cop stationed on the corner, the intelligence can really flow like like that. From, uh, yes, the, most, from the most localized, <clears throat> from the most localized <clears throat> government force to the most top level international. Uh, yeah, but there are filtering processes in between. Uh, <clears throat> for example, in the, the Drug Enforcement Administration in the U.S., they have a separate division called the SOG Special Operations Division. Their function is to look into the NSA data to find criminal activity. When they find that criminal activity, they tip off state and local police to go arrest people, uh, but they don't give them the data. So then in order to, this is where parallel construction comes in. <clears throat> so <Right. clears throat> when it comes to criminally prosecuting, they can't use the NSA data in a court of law acquired without a warrant inadmissible. So that what they have to do is do uh, standard uh, policing techniques go around and find all the data. Of course, it helps you that you know where it is and what it is. So that makes them look really good, you know. And so uh, Reuters reported this, I think, in August of 2013. And they, they said uh, they interviewed one of the federal agents involved in the program. And he said, uh, this is such a great program. I just hope we can keep it secret. Well, I mean, that's secret laws and secret applications of, of data. That's perjury in a court of law. So they aren't, and under the under the parallel construction rules, they're not allowed to tell the court or the lawyers involved, or you can't put it in sworn affidavits or anything. You can make, make no reference whatsoever to it in the in the court proceedings. Well, <clears throat> that's a total subversion of the judicial process, and that's not just in the U.S. because those FBI and DEA have relationships around the world, and through the MLAT network, in the Mutual Law Enforcement Act treaty, <clears throat> they share this information worldwide with all participating uh, groups. And so, right. you know, it's subverting everybody's process. It's, it's just, just un underlying, it's a total subversion of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, judicial system around the yeah. world. You yeah. know, so this is the destruction of the, any, any hope of democracy anywhere. Absolutely. So um, recently, I think it was in January, <laughs> I published a big piece called They Spy With Their Little Eye based on findings from WikiLeaks documents that where WikiLeaks had published the CIA dispatch orders to Five Eye partner countries to send human intelligence operatives to spy on the French presidential election, to infiltrate the top five French political parties, to uh, identify their key figures, to get their hands on their strategic planning and internal planning documents, and a whole raft of other instructions. Now, there you mean a interfere of things in their election? Is that what you mean? To interfere <laughs> in the democratic process, to undermine the democratic yeah. process of yeah. an allied nation yep. and to use other allied nations to do that, to make them equally culpable in that. Now, there was a couple of things that were very interesting to me. One was the fact that the U.S. was dispatching spies from New Zealand New Zealand spies are supposed to work for New Zealand. They're not supposed to work for the U.S. So our right. resources are being dispatched by the USA. The yep. other thing that's particularly interesting to me is that the WikiLeaks disclosures showed that there was two sets of orders 
for the same mission. There was the set that they sent to the partner countries telling them what to do and telling them the reasons, the supposed reasons why they should do it. Yep. And then there was a US only set of instructions <laughs> for the <Yeah>. same mission. <laughs> And the US only set revealed that they had completely different reasons and goals than what they were telling the countries who they were dispatching. And that showed me that there is no loyalty at all. There's no transparency at all. They will lie to yeah. other countries. No, it's a, it's a standard. It, yeah, but it's standard with spy agencies and so on. I mean, this is called disinformation and manipulation. Uh, Russians call it disinformatia and manipulatia, okay? I mean, this has been going on for, since, uh, you know, you could go back even before World War I, they, people were, and these organizations were doing it. So it's not, uh, it's how, it started, it's how diplomat, uh, diplomacy started, right? How can you manipulate people to do what you want them to do and, and get them as an ally? And or <clears throat> if, if, they're, if their uh, system is electing somebody who's not going to be quite as good as an ally as someone else, then you try to help support that other person so that you get the best person for your policies in. So, I mean, this is standard. But based on the contents <laughs> of these documents, Russia Gate should be France Gate. Yeah, that's right. It is. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the latest with the timestamps on last modified times with the fat file format says, hey, you know, everything they've been saying is false. That's about the, the published uh, WikiLeaks uh, DNC emails. I mean, that was the issue, right? So from the beginning, and it's clearly, clearly that was a, a physical transport of some distance before WikiLeaks posted it. So, you know, it's a matter of uh, facing the truth and they don't want to do that. So they're going to try to avoid that at any cost. That's why so they won't I call me to testify, by the way. <laughs> I mean, well, they said they, they weren't called Julian either. They weren't no, called no, Julian. They won't, or Craig Murray or, or Ambassador Craig Murray, they will call him. You know, they won't call anybody that has anything, any firsthand knowledge or any relevant uh, forensics about it. They'll listen to somebody who's feeding them information that they want to, they want constructed and to hear. But no backup Steele. whatsoever. You know, they had no Steele control of anything. Point. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like they don't, they don't have any control of the evidence uh, and they never have had. So, and that was the, and Comey said, well, you know, who should have done that? Well, you know. That was the first thing they did with us was come in and take everything they had. They didn't ask. They came in and just took it. What's the matter with doing that with the DNC? If they file a complaint, go get the server, period. You know. So how, what, how do we get to the point where, you know, in 2011, we um, yeah. were able to, actually in 2012, we were able to establish that in 2011, Obama's White House was um, complicit in uh, getting the DHS and FBI to spy on Occupy protesters. For years, we watched activists being targeted. We watched journalists being targeted, publishers being targeted. But how did we get to the point where the a presidential candidate is being targeted, an entire presidential campaign in the U.S. is being targeted? It seems like there's an escalation of criminality. Yeah. Well, I, I call it the arrogance of power. They now believe they are above the law. And so they can do it openly without fear of being prosecuted. That's why I keep saying these people are all criminals. We have to look back, we have to go back, we have to indict them and, and put them in jail. Otherwise, I mean, I blame this all on Jerry Ford. Vice President Ford became the president after Nixon got uh, impeached and he pardoned Nixon. Well, <clears throat> that said, every other president after that has got to get out of jail free card, it's the next president. Why? Because the next president's gonna wanna do what he needs to do, what he perceives he needs to do. And so in order to be able to do that, He's got to have a free reign to do it. So he, he has to be backed up in insurance, have an insurance policy with the next president who also wants to do the same thing. And so therefore, he, in order to do that, he's got to pardon the guy before him if he ever comes under indictment. So um, I think the only thing that can happen is like internationally with the international crimes that were committed under the Bush administration, other countries can issue, uh, you know, indictments against uh, uh, sitting uh, presidents and uh, political people here in the U.S. So that if they travel anywhere, they can be arrested. I think that's and the now, best. Way. And <laughs> they they abuse the FISA process to uh, oh, do this. Yeah, it's a joke. Um, the, which, the whole process is a joke. Which Edward Snowden had been warning people about repeatedly that this was a mm. rubber stamp court. 
But yeah, but it's uh, also used as cover for the real uh, criminal activity behind the scenes. They use the five, I mean, these judges don't know what they're doing. They have no idea about national security. Oh, national security, I'll sign it, you know. That's exactly what's going on. Uh, whereas, you know, we have a current, I have a, I have a current lawsuit against them with, I'm, uh, with a lawyer in Tennessee. We're in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals now, and it's still going, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> which says basically uh, charging them with all these crimes of um, bulk collection on everybody, you know, violation of all their rights and everything. And uh, I use some of the Snowden material as exhibits uh, because I basically invented half of what was on the slides. So I knew exactly how everything worked. And I haven't changed very much at all. I mean, you know, it's only been, uh, it's almost 20 years now that I've been out of NSA and they haven't done anything different. I mean, these are, this is really a, an intellectual enterprise here. You know, they're really being creative here. So, I mean, I, I back then in the 90s had a lot more I was going to do, but thankfully I did not do that. Otherwise, you know, there was a lot more they could be doing to interfering on everybody's actions. So, I mean, I was going to automate the process of gaining knowledge out of massive amounts of data, you know, first filtering out the needles and then, and then uh, figuring out uh, from profiles and from interactions and transactions uh, between uh, parties in the, in the data that, were, that we pulled in, we could figure out their intentions and capabilities. And that would, uh, that would happen automatically, which means it would happen on the entire world, that they would have been able to do that for the entire world, everybody in it. And so that's why that's why I was glad I didn't get to do that. <laughs> and they're still struggling with that too. They still can't figure out what's in massive amounts of data. That's why under Obama they issued the big data initiative. You know, so it's the same thing. It's uh, their inability to deal with massive amounts of data, and that's why they're failing at stopping any of these terrorist attacks. They can't like do it. Like in case in point in Christchurch yeah. in my, in New Zealand in my homeland, um, yeah. that was yeah. a, a a horrific. Yeah. incident a horrific terrorist attack um and for me it, it, it's even more bitterly sad because i have been telling new zealanders for seven years that our counter-terrorism resources have been inappropriately squandered on targeting mm. activists and journalists you know myself i had no history of violence no access to weapons no military training nothing that could ever indicate that i would be a physical threat to anybody in my country or anywhere else and yeah. yet the resources that should have been used to target a guy who's buying <laughs> stacks of assault weapons after having just been through Pakistan <laughs> and North Korea and every other bloody place, um, yeah. is, it goes under the radar. They claim they had no yeah. knowledge of his existence. How, how is that even possible? Is it just <laughs> that their priorities are not finding the guy with the assault rifles going to the mosque? Their priorities are suppressing dissent. Yeah, for me, that's that's. See, I would look at that basically as a very simple process. Uh, uh, for example, over here, the fellow who uh, did the shooting down in Florida, there in, in uh, one of the bars. I mean, he had already in, expressed his intentions for violence, so that was the threat. You know, uh, it's it's intention, right? The first the first indicator is intention. That was his intention to hurt people. Then he went and bought an AR-15. That's capability. So now you have intentions and capabilities. So now you know you've got alerts right away, and that's it's really that simple. It's not really that difficult when you know when you know these people, and every every terrorist attack that I know of, even before 9/11, uh, we knew these people were bad people, and we knew they had bad intentions, and and we simply didn't watch them. That we because we were doing this bulk stuff, looking at everybody on the planet, you know. So I I, I basically looked at it this way: if if you take uh, all of the countries involved in this. Uh, in this uh, bulk acquisition and monitoring process uh, and pull together all the analysts they have devoted doing that, there, there's probably no more than 20,000 analysts looking at it worldwide. And so the problem is they're looking at the world. Well, that's about 4.5 billion people. So if you divide 20,000 into 4.5 billion, each analyst has to look at more than 200,000 people. Now, I don't know anybody <laughs> that can do that. It's just not a possible. It's just not possible. They made they made the job impossible for them to do it. I mean, even e that's only if they could uniquely divide them. <clears throat> who is watching who? Only one person watching each individual, and uh, that individual wasn't looked at by more than one person. That's only if you could uniquely divide it that way. And they don't even do that because they use, do a lot of duplicate look, like uh, the terrorist organizations and so on. They're all watched by all these countries, so that's replication of the same. So it reduces even further. 
the effort and time they had to look for uh, threats coming. And even internally from some of the snow material, there's uh, documentation of, uh, of uh, uh, memos being sent internally by analysts in NSA and MI5 and various organizations saying, we are just buried in data. We have too much data. We're overburdened by overload and we can't see the threats coming. You know, and we we are in great dire jeopardy of not being able to find anything in advance. Well, that's been the profile of what's happening, right? Every time these attacks occur, the real ones, I mean, they're great at uh, entrapping people, right? But uh, that's not a true threat. The real threats come through and actually happen. And then after the fact, they look at who did it, and then they say, oh, we've got all this data on this person, so we'll go into that now, and then and then they can branch out from that. So they're really good forensically. So in other words, they're becoming a police organization. It's a forensics issue because they've got all the data and everybody, they can do a really good forensics job, right? But when it comes to predicting things in advance, they can't. Somebody just said in um, chat, wait, so are you supporting mass surveillance, Susie? Because that's the only way they can stop someone like the G terrorist. Uh, Just uh, the Christchurch sheriff. So just a couple of points there. One, literally everything I've ever written and every interview I've ever done has been yeah. against <laughs> surveillance, not for it. So, no, I'm, I don't support it. Second of all, we already have mass surveillance that is proven <laughs> front, left, backwards and sideways, has been for at least five years now, but arguably we knew about it even before that. Um, so that yeah. is the regime we live under. It's not a prospective regime. It's already here. It's already happening. And third of all, under this oppressive mass surveillance regime, they weren't able to find that terrorist. So I completely disagree that <laughs> mass surveillance stops terrorism. But what mass surveillance does is provide a pervasive system of global control. And yep. if you watch my previous interview with Bill Binney, we actually went through uh, the systemic control that the NSA has over Uh, education, technology, the political sphere, the media, every social (laughs) control, every aspect of human existence. That is what mass surveillance is about. And that is what the message Bill Binney has been telling us all for years. And that's what I called the first major swindle of of the public for all the funds that it took to do it. I mean, that was the whole idea of giving up privacy for security was been a lie from the beginning. And the people who uh, at NSA knew that and CIA, they all knew that uh, because uh, we had already demonstrated it with the Thin Thread program that you could pull out relevant information and let the entire flow of information go by that wasn't relevant. So in other words, you only pulled in the needles. You didn't pull in the, uh, and also the development of material around it based on human behavior related to that. And a deduct using deductive, inductive, and abductive logic, you could easily do that. And that's what we were doing. That's why we could do, be so successful. Uh, but that was, and, and that was to show, you know, how you could do it for the entire world. And that's what we proposed to do in January of 2001 for NSA. And that's what Hayden rejected uh, b- because it didn't fit the plan of getting lots and lots of money. It would have only cost $9 million to do the world for terrorism. And that was too cheap. And it was too effective. And so, and it didn't give them power over everybody, which Cheney wanted. So Cheney was the guy who wanted knowledge on everybody. So he had to collect everything to do that. Uh, And uh, Hayden wanted to build an empire. And by being required to collect everything, that took a whole lot more money than the 3.8 billion he was initially asking for to just to develop the trailblazer program, not deploy, not implement or any of that. That was follow on costs. So, I mean, this was... This has been the lie well, from the sir. beginning, and they swindled us over the, for a lot of money, close to a half a trillion dollars to get that. That was the big first big swindle. The second one was cybersecurity, when in fact they knew from you know Vault Vault Seven, Vault Eight, all the stuff from NSA, the Martin releases, and all that. They knew all the weaknesses in firewalls and operating systems, switches, servers, everything in the world, even private networks and so on. But they never told anybody, so nobody fixed it. So no, we were all sitting here vulnerable. This was a second swindle. So then, then when we get attacked, they would say, oh, we need more money for cybersecurity. Well, <clears throat> you won't have cybersecurity unless you fix the problems you know. And they aren't doing that. Why? Because that gives them their open window into seeing what people are doing. And that's what they want to keep. So, And now the third swindle is this Russiagate thing, going into a... Uh, going into a uh, uh, a swindle for starting another Cold War. So this way we can be swindled out of a few more trillions of dollars. 
So, you know, it's just a continuing swindle, the shadow government and the military industrial complex and, and everybody that's involved in government with that. So, you know, we've been swindled and several times over and this business about you can't stop terrorism without this bulk stuff. That's a lie. And there's absolutely no doubt that the individuals involved are directly personally profiting from it because oh, yeah. I know in our absolutely. last discussion, we looked at an example where someone had left the NSA, had started a infrastructure company, a digital infrastructure company, and had then promptly been contracted back for to the tune of billions, um, yeah. had a, received a contract to the tune of billions from NSA. So it seems that they almost, it's almost like a graduate, yep. a graduate program. <laughs> like they work there for X amount of years and then they graduate into the private sector and are richly rewarded for it. I call that, uh, as do others who are familiar with it, an incestuous relationship. It's the same basic family. They just trade back and forth. Uh, for example, in the Trailblazer program, <clears throat> uh, they hired in an, uh, a vice president of SAIC to manage all these transformation programs, including Trailblazer. And when they did that at NSA, and this goes on at every agency, by the way, not just, it's not unique to NSA, uh, nor is it unique to other countries, okay? So, but when they hire them in to manage that, they manage all these multi hundreds of million dollars of contracts every year. And so the first big contract, where does it go? Back to the home company, SAIC. So they now are managing the biggest contract going. So then, and then, so when this, this guy quits NSA quickly because the, the, the curtain was falling on, on the program and how it was embezzling and basically uh, overcharging, defrauding, if you will, the government, he quickly got out of there and went back to SAIC for a nice round $800,000 sign-on bonus for doing such a great job, you know? <laughs> so it's just a sick uh, process where we're all swindled. So, so in New Zealand now, there's actually going to be a public inquiry into the intelligence services. Not the first public inquiry we've had into the intelligence services, but it's specifically yeah. in relation to their abject failure to, um, to notice the existence of the repeated social media threats of the Christchurch terrorists several days yep. in advance of him killing 50 people, 51 people. Um, yeah. What what likelihood is there that a they'll the intelligence agencies will tell the truth in those inquiries, or b that there will be any meaningful redress? Uh, uh, first of all, I'd say that the probability of them telling you the truth is probably zero. Uh, you can bet on the fact that they will lie to you, uh, and so or try to deceive you and manipulate you in some way. Uh, and and the uh, the idea of any retribution or any kind of accountability is also a joke so far anyway. Uh, the actually the only person I was hoping that would start to do this was the current president, President Trump. No one else. Everybody else was a part of the game. You know, all the political parties they were all part of it. The Congress and all that, all these big governmental uh, people in charge of these agencies and so on, and do, doing the oversight. No, they're all they're all part of the problem. The FISA court, that's part of the problem. Uh, the, the FBI, the DOJ, uh, all of the all, Department of Justice here, all of them, they're all part of this problem. And so, therefore, they all have to cover up for one another. Otherwise, you know, they're all exposed. Once one falls, it's a domino effect. You know, they all start to fall. Well, if you're doing this, why are you cooperating with them, giving them? And then what are they doing with it? You know, so they all start to fall. So uh, that's the kind of thing they're trying to avoid in order to do that. They have to cover up what's going on and protect one another. And that's basically what's happening. And so we have a very, I, I think it's about probably 80, 20, there might be some accountability. I mean, they may have some of the low level people that put them in jail, but they won't do any of the people who really orchestrated the uh, corruption. Right, fascinating. Um, Bill, while you're here too, I'd like to <laughs> try and debunk a couple of pervasive myths with you that I see flying around all the time. One of those is um, this narrative that the NSA and the CIA are in competition with each other and that the CIA uh, had Edward Snowden infiltrate the NSA so that they could uh, embarrass the NSA and that they were trying to harm the NSA or shut down the NSA mm -hmm. for the CIA's benefit. Um, what can you tell me about that from your experience inside the agencies? Uh, I would say right off the bat, that's false. 
Uh, and I give a very concrete example, which I'll try to describe to you without being too, too specific. Uh, I was working on a little program for another such agency, which we won't mention the name, but at any rate, uh, we, uh, and, and this is after I retired from NSA and we started really pulling together information that nobody realized they had and it was being done with data that NSA should have fixed, but didn't. Okay, so, and as a part of that, uh, in the end, we were making them look like really uh, fools, NSA. So uh, the one of the deputy directors of the other agency, uh, this one in and you're talking about, said we have to we have to terminate this contract because it's going to embarrass the fort. Uh -huh. um, so uh, that that said, uh, no, they're not. That basically says no, they're not trying to do that. Uh, they want to. They, they want to now cooperate. And that was back in uh, two thousand and five. Um, I mean, there also, is competition. They they did have competition as to who could figure out the right, the right situation. You know, and what what was correct there. Uh, that was an internal kind of competition, but it wasn't to subvert or embarrass one another. So right. Because from our study in the Snowden files, we saw that the agency seems to encourage the movement of staff and employees between the agencies. So we'd see from the lowest levels to the executive, yeah. uh, even Hay Hayden, you know, classic example, NSA director, CIA director, like they, they move back and forward between these revolving doors, which makes it, and, and there were examples of three or four generations of families working mm -hmm. in one agency or both or the yep. other, um, which seems that the culture is, the, that the loyalty is to the intelligence community rather than just to the specific agency. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And uh, to continue the agency, to keep it going, uh, instead of the oath that they take to, and when they go to work for those agencies, it's to protect and defend the constitution, not the agency. And, and in fact, uh, if you look at a classification, this is one of the reasons I argued a lot of the material that uh, Edward Snowden had released was evidence of a crime against the uh, founding principles of our nation and various other laws we had. And so, therefore, under Executive Order 13526, Section 1.7, which governs the classification of data, they must declassify that because it's evidence of a crime and you can't hide it with classification. That's what that says. Uh, so I I, uh, I just like to take that kind of thing into a court of law, and we're trying to do that in the Third Circuit right now, Third Circuit Court of Appeals here in the U.S., which is in that one of the next courts down from the Supreme Court. So we're going to try to get to the Supreme Court and expose all of this for what it is. Um, so do you think that the agencies themselves are inherently corrupt? Like, do you think they're unsalvageable <clears throat> at this point? I, I think they need uh, major lobotomies, yeah. Uh, it's a matter of making sure that uh, they start to do the right thing uh, and they aren't inclined to do that right now. They're all basically uh, doing their own thing for their own reasons and certainly not for the benefit of the country, the administration or decision making in foreign relations. That's the other problem I saw with when I was talking to Pompeo when he was dire director of CIA. I said, you know, these agencies are lying to you, you're not getting the facts from them. How can you make proper decisions when, the, when that's the way it is, you know? So, I mean, you know, it's just a corrupt process that needs to be fixed. And in order to do that, <clears throat> that requires major, major lobotomies and major surgery, I'm my, in my belief. So, I mean, they need to be slapped on the face and hammered down and, and ironed out. If people don't want to do the right thing, you need to get rid of them. And so, I mean, that you can't tolerate this, especially in these agencies, because they're so, they have so much power behind the scene. You know, and NSA always pushes FBI and CIA out front to take the hits while they sit in the back and do all the all the dirty work. <laughs> that's the whole. That's really their plan. That's what they've been operating. That's why they operated for decades. Mm. I'm struck too by a line that was in one of the Snowden files where they said that they view the partner agencies of the partner countries as an extension of their own resources. So yep. that it's yep. basically, it's like a leech mentality. You know, they, they make these partnerships so they can leech the data and so that they can use them as satellite forces, proxy forces. Um, yeah, it's extra resources that they have, yeah. Yeah, it, <laughs> it, it gives them an, an international force in, in the truest sense without having to necessarily pay for it. 
It's my, it's my grandson. Um, so, <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's cool. He's, he's right here. So, here. Here, here he goes. There he is. Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Oh, so hi, can you say hi? <laughs> oh, <okay>. Hi. <laughs> there you go, buddy. <laughs> so, um, Bill, <laughs> someone asked an intelligent question about marble framework that I think you'd be interested in. They wanted yeah. to know if there is any known provable case yet of it being used for uh, reverse attribution. So I take that to mean... Can we say for sure that Marble Framework has been used to uh, create attribution of a hack to a, a an innocent country that wasn't actually responsible for it? Uh, well, I mean, I think the uh, somewhere along the line, somebody compromised that that framework was used in 2016, but we don't know exactly where that was uh, where that was uh, uh, done. So I, you know, I can't really uh, I don't, we we can't prove uh, any given case. Uh, but you know, there's some suspicion that some of it was done uh, with the with the uh, with the Democratic National Committee and and uh, uh, and for and uh, Podesta emails and so on. So you never know, <laughs> and we can't prove any of it. So that but the code works. The I mean, the the software to do it is exists, and uh, you can bet <clears throat> you can bet they've used it somewhere. It's like right. how, how many how many places other than uh, Iran have the Stuxnet virus been used? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, the problem is that once those viruses get out, uh, whoever created them has no more control over them, and uh, people can modify them to do different things. So it's a it's a matter now of, of watching the. You know, now we have to defend against the a, a modified Stuxnet coming back at us. So, you know, it's a, it's, and, and they know this, okay? So why aren't they trying to fix things? Well, because then they won't be able to look in, you know? So if they fix, if, if the, all the industries and communication companies, if they fix their problems, uh, that's gonna make it more difficult for them to look in and see what they're doing. So, you know, it's a matter of, uh, uh, it's a matter of the opposite. In, in, in NSA, there's two camps. One is the operations, that's where I was, where you, where you go out and attack things and figure out what people are doing and saying. And the other was the defensive side, the uh, information assurance director, uh, where they defend the uh, U.S. networks and, and crypt systems and so on. Uh, and they don't really communicate that well together. Uh, case in point, I'd figured out something was over in, in the operations side. And I went, went off to the uh, uh, IAD side and I said, here's how this works over here. Do you guys do something similar? I was just looking for a similarity kind of thing that they had. They had organizational problems for doing things uh, that they uh, they did on our side, and we had we had uh, we had figured out what the others were doing, and so we said, "Hey, do you guys do a similar thing?" And they wouldn't say, <laughs> so they wouldn't tell us just the basic symbol. Yes, all they had to do was say, "Sure," you know. Uh, well, in fact, I know that's the way they do things anyway. So it doesn't take too much to figure this stuff out. So. But the, the idea was they weren't prepared to cooperate. So, And so when we figure out the holes over here and the problems over here, why the hell should we tell them? You know, Because if we tell them, they're liable to fix it. If they fix it, our windows close. You know, So that's the, that's the game that's being played. God, it would be a delicious irony if WikiLeaks yeah. um, were the ones to publish the existence of Marble Framework and Marvel mm. Framework having been, in the context of Marvel Framework, having been used to um, falsely attribute the DNC yeah. leaks. I find that amusing. Equally as amusing, actually, as uh, Ecuador and the UK's PR strategy surrounding yeah. the expulsion of Julian being also leaked to WikiLeaks yesterday. I found that to be a delicious irony as well. Julian certainly has a knack for getting yeah. his hands on the right <laughs> stuff. Well, I mean, I think that says that there are really still some a lot of good people around who want to try to get the truth out. So I, yeah, I think that's yeah, what that absolutely. says. There yeah. must be people within all of these places who are mortified. I mean, we have to yeah. imagine <clears throat> that there is still an Edward Snowden in the NSA or two or three oh, yeah. who are looking at what's happening and and who are yeah, mortified yeah. by it. Um, and I know I know there's uh, some some still some good people in the DOJ too. Because uh, when when, uh, when they were doing all kinds of things, trying to put us in jail for like 35 years using the Espionage Act, uh, why uh, someone in the DOJ 
uh, passed out the draft indictment they had of us. So, so we got that through a different, Amazing. a different path, but it showed all the lies they were compiling about us, which gave us more ammunition for a malicious prosecution when we went to court. And that's why they left us alone. Okay. Cause we had all the goods on them for what they were doing. So now we know that the CIA has nominated WikiLeaks as what they called a traditional espionage target. They claim that WikiLeaks was elevated to that status in 2017. We know that's nonsense. Mm. We know that they yeah. were being targeted in that way since 2010 when Julian was first put on the Pentagon manhunt list. But what are the types? We also know that CIA is an NSA customer. So anybody that CIA is targeting is going to be targeted by NSA by default. What types of um, methods, what, what can we anticipate would be happening to Julian and anyone who's around him as a result of that level of targeting? Uh, well, um, I, 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 they would certainly like to put him away for, in jail for at least 35 years. Uh, using the Espionage Act and so on. So, uh, but the Espionage Act, if you're working, if they can show working for another foreign government, which they haven't, well, that's why I say they were trying to connect the Russians to, then the Espionage Act also carries with it the death penalty. They can use that also. So, <clears throat> but the, the point is alleging that, the, that, that he's a, a foreign intelligence agency. I mean, intelligence agencies have resources to go after and figure out or or diplomats or so on, or, or uh, people roaming around looking at things and gathering data and sending it back in. Julian has none of that. All he's got is people telling him and giving him data. So he's, he, he can't be classified that way because he doesn't have resources to do what they're claiming uh, would have, he would have to have if he was a foreign intelligence agency, because he's not a foreign intelligence agency. He, has no, he doesn't have the resources to do that kind of thing. He's got to depend on people giving him information, just like every other newspaper or TV program and so on. They have to depend on their sources to give them data so they can tell the public. So, uh, you know, it, it's all, uh, that, that, that attempt to classify him that way is kind of ridiculous. It seems like on a grander scale, um, an example of the same types of things I've been complaining about, which is uh, these resources that should be used against violence, extremists and terrorists yeah. being applied against journalists and activists mm -hmm. and anyone who dissents against the status quo. Um, Bill, what is your message to Julian sitting in the embassy now, not knowing if or when they are mm -hmm. going to drag him off? What would you want to say to him? Well, I, I would just say, you know, keep your strength up, uh, do the best you can to, to stay fit and so on, and, and uh, keep, your, um, keep your spirits up because there's a lot of people out here who support you. And uh, we'll continue to do that as best we can. I mean, that's what I, I would it's, tell. It's so important that we are, we are really so lucky that we have you, um, both in the strength of your support for Julian and for WikiLeaks and your public advocacy work. Um, but also because you yourself are a little, a little version of WikiLeaks repository of information that otherwise the public wouldn't have access to, mm. your brain. And when I get to talk to you about these things, um, I feel very much that I'm, I'm wiser as a result of it, and particularly in, in my uh, field of work. So mm. thank you so much <laughs> for doing what you do. Well, I mean, I feel, I feel in, my, in my way, I'm, I'm basically the only... I looked at it this way. I, I helped create half this crap, <laughs> as I say. Uh, so I, I made it possible for them to be able to do this. I mean, I built protections in, but they removed those. And so everything I do now, I plan for evil at the top. So in other words, I'm going to be building in stuff that whatever I do from now on that will uh, uh, disable or, uh, or else alert everyone to what the evil at the top is doing, and they won't have any control of it whatsoever. <laughs> so it will just automatically occur. You know, I have to plan for that because obviously, you know, anything you develop as a mathematician or, you know, a programmer or so on, uh, any capabilities you develop really, it's like a double-edged sword. You know, it can be good, used for good, or it can be used for evil. And so the whole idea is to put, put things in that aren't documented in the process that are sitting there waiting for the evil to try to engage and use it evil, in an evil way. And at that point, you just blow the lid off everything automatically. And so they have no control of that happening. And so that's, see, that's the point that evil needs to have control of knowledge. 
That's the point about it. That's what this bulk data is all about. Evil being enabling evil at the top. So yeah, it's a, they're enabling their own supremacy yeah. over the human race. That's right. And the, the continuation of that supremacy. Um, I mean, this is nothing yeah. new. This is historically what you know, yeah. despots and you know, dictatorships and so on have always done. It's their their insurance policy. Yeah. It's them tipping tipping the scales in their own favor, um, and that's why it's remarkable to me that in their own documents they repeatedly refer to the system of control as the global network. They've yeah. always envisioned it as being the entire planet. That's right. That's exactly right. And they I mean, that's what Alexander said when he was visiting Menlith Hill Station in England. He got up there and said that uh, our objective is to collect it all. And that they was, have uh, no right. They have no right. <laughs> Well, they're just violating every every uh, constitution in the world and every uh, and any number of laws all around the world. And I'm I'm surprised that you know governments. I mean, the Austrian government, by the way, has done uh, as the first government to to start moving in the right direction. Their Supreme Court uh, ruled bulk acquisition of data is unconstitutional, and and their parliament voted down a bill to do bulk acquisition in in uh, about last year, I believe it was. So at that point. Austria has now moved the right way. <clears throat> even the even the EU and some of their GDPR statements are now moving the right way. Uh, and now all they have to do is start suing the companies enabling the, the process because they have to operate in Europe too. So in, the, <clears throat> in order to do that, they are now exposed and they're the weak link in all of this. So the whole idea is that they should uh, start lawsuits against them for what they've been doing with NSA and GCHQ and all the Five Eyes and the rest of these D&D included. I mean, uh, the German equivalent of NSA CIA, they, they're doing the same thing. So I, I, the point is this a targeted approach that we developed under thin thread is an effective way of stopping terrorism or stopping criminality. Uh, bulk acquisition is not. It's, it's like it's helping to enable their capability to at least make the first attack. And then after that, they're exposed. But, uh, uh, you know, not stopping the attack means people die to keep the whole process going. And that's that's wow. where I object. I mean, and I guess they view it as saying uh, their power over everyone is more important. People die all the time, so if a few more die this year or that, it doesn't really matter. We need to give our power continue, and that's where I I object to uh, totally because they need to stop the tr whole objective of intelligence is to predict intentions and capabilities. It's and so you can stop uh, bad things from happening. Not not do forensic jobs after the fact and be able to say, here's all the data we know. Yeah, we knew these people were bad, but, you know, we couldn't, you know, make whatever excuse you want for failure. It's failure. So. Well, absolutely. They've totally <clears throat> failed and, and dramatically exceeded their mandate. I don't think yeah. that they have the support of the people who fund them, the, who pay for them. Um at this point, from the sum total of my study, it appears that every single partner agency of the NSA all around the world are serving a foreign government, and that is yep. the definition of treason. It is literally yeah, and, packaging up yeah. the data of their own citizens. Absolutely. It's treason. And, and let me put it, even within the United States, you know, uh, uh, NSA and CIA and the intelligence community interpreted Section 215 of the Patriot Act is allowing them to collect all the metadata on everybody in the, in the United States and the planet. So, But in fact, uh, the people who wrote that law, the Patriot Act, uh, Sensenbrenner in the House and uh, Leahy were the main drivers in the Senate. Those two folks came out afterward and said, after it was exposed what they were doing, they said, well, it was never intended that you were, you were to do this kind of thing. That was never the intention of the Congress and the law that you should do this. Well, that's a violation of the of the intent of Congress in writing laws, and that's a felony, by the way. <laughs> so, and it's our our intelligence agencies and so on who are manipulating their reading and understanding of the law to do what they want to do. These people need to be held accountable for this. Otherwise, you know, they can read anything they want any way they want and do whatever they want and say, well, that's our interpretation of what you wrote. When in fact, Congress didn't have that intent in, in, the, in writing that law. And, and that fundamentally is, a, is, the, uh, is, a under, is the basic corruption involved in all of this. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a matter of you can't write words that they will interpret the way you want them interpreted 
when you write the words, they'll interpret whatever they whatever they want from it. That's like they do. They use the Executive Order one three one one two triple three section two three C to collect all the data on U.S. citizens to violate our Constitution and laws and everything inside the United States. So they don't really care about law. They're above the law. That's why they're getting so arrogant. They do it openly, and nobody's done a damn thing about it, right? They aren't held even with, even even at the level of targeting a prison, right? Even at that level. But I mean, I would say we're starting to hear more about it because some of the other politicians are being targeted too. That's now yeah, now it to, seems to yeah, be the case. You know, hey, you know, <laughs> we got to stop this. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. You know, and I, I remember saying the same thing about um, surveillance, um, the spread mm. of surveillance, um, yeah. that it was never going to be a finite thing because they've introduced a profit motive and a profit motive requires growth and growth means that more targets mm. and uh, they've, yep. they've escalated it to the point where the entire society is now a target. Um, yep. And they have moved up through the ranks from those who have the least social capital to those who have the most social capital and political capital. And, you know, what next after you target the prisons of the United States? What, what comes <clears throat> next after that? Um, I feel yeah. that many people say <clears throat> that the American empire is going to implode. Um, I certainly hope that the power of these intelligence agencies will follow the same course because it seems that they've hit the ceiling now and what, where can they go beyond here? Yeah. Well, I mean, when you have everything, you have everything. So, exactly. I mean, yeah. so it's hard to, it's hard to go beyond that is what, what you're saying. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's true. <clears throat> and I also can't well, help the, but uh, think the other part of it though, well, well, the, sorry, the, the, the only thing they could do beyond that is start to use it more effectively internally and against everybody. You know, so it's well, like, that yeah. seems to be the logical next step. I remember yeah. writing an article about um, the situation in Europe, and I discovered that the Philip Mudd um, from the CIA, um, deputy <laughs> director of the CIA, um, until they, yeah, he quit, uh, resigned officially, <laughs> um, saying that he believed that France was going to become the second country to extrajudicially assassinate its own citizens by drone strike. Um, I reported that, I believe, in 2016. Mm. And last year it was revealed that France have, in fact, been assassinating French citizens um, in the Middle East by drone strike. And that makes me think it's not going to stop with the US and with France. It is going to be country after country that decide mm. to take that step to extrajudicially assassinate their own people. And then how long is it really before they're not just delivering a pizza by drone in the United States. They're delivering <laughs> a extrajudicial sentence of death. Yeah. With no due I mean, process. Is, yeah. is, that, is that out of the, is that out of the bounds of imagination, you know, given that trajectory? <clears throat> well, we've done that overseas, you know, with the uh, Alaki and his son. So, I mean, uh, that's what we've done already. And in fact, when the inquiries in the, in the, uh, I think it was the Senate, uh, the then uh, uh, Attorney General uh, under Obama was asked the question, uh, are we uh, intending to use drones inside the United States to do this kind of thing? And he would not answer. You know, so... Uh, Unbelievable. Oh, God, it a, makes me it, sick. It, it well, makes it me sick. It's, like the, it's the worst sci-fi movie. And, I mean, Chris Hedges says the same thing yeah. about the United States citizens being indefinitely yeah. detained on U.S. soil black sites on U.S. soil, that this is yeah. the future. And um, yeah. now that, as you say, now that they have everything, will the system begin to just feed upon its own citizenry? I think that's that's the big question. And what do well, we I do? I think it started that. that. It's, it's already started, that, you know, with the parallel yeah. construction and all that. So that's already started. So it's like, uh, it, it's like the, I mean, eventually, uh, I think what Chris is thinking of, you know, which is probably not too far off, uh, of what we did to the Japanese during World War II inside the U.S. Japanese, U.S. Japanese, U.S. citizen, but Japanese descent, you know, we incarcerated them. So in mass, uh, you know, it was a dis disgusting thing to do with no probable cause whatsoever. And, and these were people who were, you know, most of them, I think, were quite patriotic and ashamed of what their country did. So, oh, of uh, course, they are, their, only crime, their, only, yeah. their only crime was their demographic. Their demographic yeah. was... 
deficient to target but, them. But that gives them that gives them a precedent, you know, a historical precedent to take actions like that. And I'm sure that's what these people are saying. If we have a problem with somebody, let's get rid of them somehow. Oh. Bill, um, we have to go because we're over time. Um, okay. Two things. Somebody has just said that they watched A Good American featuring you and that it was an absolutely brilliant film. So I urge everybody, I also saw The Good American some time ago, um, I urge everybody to go and watch The Good American and just to type William Binney or Bill Binney into YouTube. Believe me, there is dozens of hours, hundreds of hours of fascinating yeah. footage of interviews with Bill that everybody should be listening to. Everybody should be educated about these topics. Um, okay. Second thing is that... In honor, <laughs> this is my black sense of humor, in honor of uh, the Snowden archive being shut by the Intercept, I have determined to restart the Decipher You uh, streams that I did analyzing the documents live online and then reporting on findings that um, haven't yet been reported on from them. There's still about 1,500 documents left, I think, um, for me to analyze that are in the public arena before we run out. Bill, would you be interested in coming on to decipher you and to looking, if I, if I find the gems, would you be interested in coming and reading through and giving your two cents about those specific programs and specific things that are contained within? Yeah, sure. Uh, if you, sure, just send me a note or something whenever you're ready. So uh, That would just be spectacular to read <laughs> NSA documents from the Snowden Files with the ex-NSA technical director. <laughs> Thank you. That would be amazing. Oh.